Welcome to a very special episode of UEN PD TV. For this episode, the video team took a road trip down to San Juan County, Utah. San Juan County, geographically, is the largest county in Utah, nearly 8,000 square miles, the size of Massachusetts. But this large, remote county poses some unique challenges for teachers and students to get from one school to another. In this episode, you're going to learn about how the San Juan School District is using instructional technology and other technology to meet the needs of their learners in this unique location. For our first stop, let's introduce you to Tracy Johnson. Tracy teaches anatomy at San Juan High School in Blanding, but it's not just the students in Blanding that can take Tracy's class. Using IVC, Interactive Video Classroom Technology, she can simultaneously broadcast her in-person class to all the students in San Juan at different high schools. This means you have a specialized course for concurrent enrollment available to everybody in the San Juan School District. I teach uh, three areas of CTE in the health science pathway. The unique challenges in, in a rural area, you know, I've only taught in a rural area, so I don't, I don't look at it so much as a challenge, just an opportunity where, fortunately, because of the technology, I get to um, reach out to all the area schools as far as Navajo Mountain, which is about, you know, 200 miles away in our district. So our district is very, very broad. So some of the challenges are that I don't get to see my students face to face on a regular basis. I have to deal with the technology which can and cannot work all the time. But it's still the opportunity is there for kids to be able to be to, to have this um, curriculum brought to them because of such a high demand for health science. And health science is everywhere in our entire county in every community and kids see that they want to come back to where they live and they want to have a career that they can um, give back as well as make a good living so this is the this is the foundation this really starts them out Legs. this is a foundations class that helps lead into uh, its its concurrent enrollment so it, it gears with um, Michelle Lyman's pathways that they have through the college through USU uh, Blanding campus and this class is simply a foundation to the, the functioning of the human body, the, the 12 body systems, uh, as well as male and female. And uh, it, it's really just learning about the human body itself, which gives them a, an idea so that they can be successful at the next level when they take a, an intense or an advanced class in anatomy. They are not scrambling. They have the, they have the basis to be successful. I'm fortunate that a number of the kids that had started here had a foundation here. Many have gone on and we've had some come back that are actually physicians, x-ray techs. They've gone into pharmacology, they've gone into physical therapy. I mean, it's a broad spectrum of everything. One of the things I'm really hoping that they continue or that they think about is a lot of kids are not really interested in the patient interaction, but because of technology and computers, you know, that is ever growing and again they still need to know about the human body but they can take this and go into some field of engineering or they can take this you know uh, biomedical engineering some of those types of, of um, different types of opportunities are out there and this this class really leads leads them down that way if they have that interest as you heard from Tracy the medical field offers a lot of career opportunities for people in the Four Corners region. Now you're going to meet Michelle Lyman. She's the director of the health program at USU Blanding. They've taken an old clinic and renovated it into a learning lab. At this location, they have a very unique piece of technology called an anatomage table. It's a virtual reality cadaver that allows students to interact, but it reduces cost and it's sensitive to Navajo cultural beliefs. We have seven programs, seven health professions programs, and those are based on community need. So they weren't just ones that we pulled out of a hat and said, what should we do? We actually went into the communities and said, where's the need? And these programs were developed based on need in the Four Corners area. And um, so the nice thing about these programs is that they can train in these programs and they can build on these programs so they are stackable credentials. So in other words, if you came in and you wanted to get a phlebotomy certificate, you could add on to that and get your medical assistant, your surgical technician. And if you can wear many hats in this area, you're very valuable because 
Um, it's very hard to recruit people for rural Utah, especially on the Utah Strip of the Navajo Reservation. But people that he live here love this area and they want to stay. And so um, they become very valuable in their communities if they can serve many, wear many hats. So the virtual cadaver, um, the reason we got that is kind of a cultural thing. Um, we have a lot of students where death is taboo and um, we, it was very difficult for them to be at real cadaver labs. Besides, cadavers are very expensive and there's a lot of paperwork involved. And so we got this um, so that our students could have access to a cadaver without having that taboo of death um, and having to have special blessings and things afterwards um, when they were exposed to a real cadaver. It's great because it is a real cadaver that's laying there on the table when you turn it on. You can dissect and choose what body system you want to look at. So we can look at the muscular system, the skeletal system, the cardiovascular system. It's very interactive table and so all of our programs are benefiting from it. For instance, it has a lot of pathology. One of the cadavers on there has um, a, a gastric cancer. And so they have pulled um, uh, slides and the, the medical lab technician students can look at those slides and they can look at varying stages of cancer cells and normal cells so it's very beneficial for that. Our surge tech students are using it because they can uh, we have a retired surgeon who comes in and, and mimics surgery so he does a gallbladder removal and our surge tech students can stand with their instruments anticipating what he's going to need next for that surgery. So every one of our programs are using it in some way. You hear that you're never very far from a Walmart, right? <laughs> I mean, people always say, everybody in America is within an hour's drive of Walmart, and that's simply not true here. Um, and that goes with everything we do. I mean, if we go to clinicals, you're gonna have to drive somewhere to go to a clinical um, for a lot of our programs. Here's a good example. We have the medical assistant program, but we have a lot of students here that work during the day, and they can only take the program at night. We have an instructor in Price that teaches the program at night, so we broadcast it down here, and those students are able to get off work, come here, take their classes, and you know they'll have their MA in a couple of semesters. But that's the kind of thing we do is we outreach to different areas. So all of our um, all of our programs on all three of our campuses where we offer our seven programs are interconnected, and our instructors share students and they share lab instructors. Um, our, this pharmacy tech room that we're in now we have software that communicates with the other um, campuses and they're able to um, mimic real uh, pharmacies where they send prescriptions back and forth so um, our technology is such that we can reach anywhere in the state and we can get we have a pathologist over in Cortez Colorado who oversees our um, medical lab tech program and he um, gets other pathologists from Colorado to broadcast over to our MLT students and talk about current topics in pathology. So it's really great because we have a huge network of providers all over the state that are willing to participate and outside of the state even that can broadcast and, and bring cutting edge education to our students. Virtual reality tools are also being leveraged in Ramsey Sumanyama's class at Whitehorse High School. Here, students are learning to not just access and use VR, but they're also creating their own apps to preserve Navajo language, culture, and stories. I think these students have like a different sort of insight um, as opposed to like an urban area where like they're in a city. A lot of the things that we deal with here are like unique to the area. For example, uh, our ELLs have like a unique, like a purely unique situation than the rest of the country. Because one, our language, like uh, Navajo, isn't like an established language and it, it's considered a dying language. So a lot of the students don't have like a really strong support system for that language. And at the same time, a lot of them are hesitant to like learn English because our grandparents went through a lot of trauma when they were younger. So learning English is like a huge issue when it comes to like older generations and the newer generations. So right now we have students that are stuck between two worlds and both of them don't know like a certain language and learning how to code is a whole third language that they need to learn, but it also gives them that problem-solving ability. So 
I think these students need to learn how to code just to be able to fit in the modern world. Um, I think uh, some of the students in Blanding came with the idea of like, if Navajo is a dying language, why don't we build an app to learn the language? And they built like a whole curriculum around that and the app's been deployed. I'm learning it. I don't know how to speak Navajo, but I'm using the app to learn it. I'm like teaching my son who's two years old to learn it. So like there's different ways to like come up with these old problems that we have. Right now, I'm, I'm focusing on one goal, is uh, how do we use this information for Navajo people? We want to be able to like bring in like older grandmothers, grandfathers, younger people. They, we want to bring them all in to use the lab. But we also want to use it to like preserve some of our culture and history. And we were very visual, like we, everything's like drawn on walls, drawn on paper or something. It's usually a diagram of some sort. And there's like a huge oral history, like not a lot of it was written down. So a lot of our traditions are passed down by telling of stories, telling like being part of ceremonies, things like that. It's a really oral rich kind of culture. But we want to take it more into the visual space. We want it to be preserved in some way, our culture and traditions. So VR is a very good space to try to get those people interested in our stories. Because like I said, our words have like a deep meaning to them. And we, we really want to explain it. So like the word yate, it means hello. And that's just like a basic English translation. But a lot of it, because my mother and my grandmother explained it to me, it has like a much deeper meaning than just saying hello. We're exploring the world and making sure like this is possible, this can be accomplished, this is like a goal that we have. So we went through games, you saw a couple students playing games. They're experiencing something that they want to try to do. Um, the, the student that pulled the sports game, he's actually a football player and he's been looking for a game this whole time that he wants to show the football players. And like I said, every time I see one of those games, I'm always thinking like, ooh, we could always introduce this to other educators. We could get them in here, you know. We have students that don't really want to participate in like uh, PE. Uh, maybe a video game would be like more comfortable for them to just like understand like why we work out and why we need to be like physical every day. It's just something that I, I think that we could do over time is to increase like the awareness of why we teach these subjects, you know. Students are like, oh, math, why do we got to learn math? And there's like a whole reasoning behind it that we know as adults but we don't have like the time of day to just say, this is why we need you to problem solve. So like coding in VR is like a really good way to just get them interacting with the material. We all know that problem solving skills are essential for any career in the 21st century, but Kristen Bushnell has taken her engineering and architecture classes and designed them around the problem solving skills that are essential to teach students and play an important role in their community. So in engineering, we're really focused on making creative uh, student choices um, so that students are able to problem solve. It's, it's a big problem in today's world that students have had so much structure through their academic lives. Um, and I love my engineering class because the kids that usually excel so much in, in other classes academically, they really struggle in here. So you get those um, overachievers that are in college classes and they get in here and you give them a problem and they go, well, how do I do it? You go, it's up to you how you solve it. And they really, like they're really at a loss. Um, and so it's, it's a good way to pose that like, well, what do you do when you're on your own and how do you problem solve? Um, the other thing I really like about my engineering classes is the kids that do maybe not so great academically, they really excel in here. Um, so it's fun to kind of level the playing field. We're doing a fairly standard lesson on bridge design um, where we talk about tension and compression forces and the students have to design a bridge that can hold as much weight as possible. Um, and so I've had only a few <laughs> be totally successful where they maxed out a bucket of sand at 50 pounds. Um, the bridges are made out of just balsa wood and so the students have to really think through a, a truss system idea. They can also do an arch or a suspension bridge, although I will give a hint here, those are not as successful. <laughs> um, so it seems like the truss bridge system works really well and students will be designing their own truss 
Um, they have to work in a pair, which is really difficult to coordinate. Um, you'll see today, like, how do the sides fit into the top and the bottom um, of the bridge? And so they, I kind of just let them go, you know, and because we want them to run into those obstacles and say, ah, like, how do we work through this together? Um, so I give guidance and support, but I definitely don't give solutions because um, I want them to come up with that on their own. I am, as a tech teacher, very old school, and uh, they'll, so they'll be hand drawing their bridge and then they'll be um, building with that. Uh, in later projects, we do use things like AutoCAD that gives them that precision, but I feel like using paper pencil is a critical component so that students understand if I draw a line on the computer what does that line actually mean and represent. For our last stop we're going to visit Patricia Helquist at Blanding Elementary School. Patricia is teaching computational thinking and she's using low-tech tools touring tumble to teach high-tech skills and the students love it. Let's check it out. I am using technology in a lot of different ways I feel. We're doing the Turing Tumble to show the kids how they, the computers actually work. And I use a lot of different programs to help motivate the kids and help keep them engaged while we're doing our lessons. I use Nearpod almost every day in our lessons. I take what our basal program has and put it into Nearpod so that the kids can respond immediately and I can keep track of how they're understanding. And it helps me to drive my instruction by the minute so that I can be as effective as possible. I use Canvas to help keep track of grading and help the kids get that immediate feedback that they need in order to take ownership of their learning. So this is Turing Tumble and the way it works is these marbles are powering the computer. So what it's doing is it's taking the electronics that are involved in coding and everything and putting it into a physical situation so that the kids can understand it better. And they have to solve all these different challenges that are in the book. We hope that I set it up right. And, but the marbles just go through and they have certain requirements. They have to get certain outcomes and they have specific objectives for each challenge. This is what we were doing and it helps them to understand the causality that's involved in um, coding and making computers do exactly what you want. So like today we were working with the interceptors which are like the shutoff valve for the computer or the end program for it and they learned quite a bit about it. They were having a really good time. Mostly it's working on the computational thinking skills to get them to think, okay, this didn't work, what do I need to change? How can I go back and fix it and try something else? Which is a real challenge for children these days. They want the answers to come immediately and to have to go back and redo something is usually painful, but in this situation they love it. It's important for kids to learn these computational thinking skills early because that's when they learn them the best. It's like learning a new language. You do it better when you're young and your brain is more absorbent, for lack of a better word. <laughs> and also, my job as a teacher is to get these kids ready to function in, in society. And this is what they're gonna be doing. They're gonna have to have these thinking skills and be able, not everyone's going to be coding computers, obviously, but they need the same thinking skills and to be able to problem solve and figure out what went wrong and how can I fix it and it doesn't matter what field they go into those are skills they're going to need so if I'm going to be a good teacher I've got to give it to them. <laughs> As you can see from our video San Juan is a beautiful part of Utah and we can all learn from the innovative ways that San Juan School District educators are using technology to connect their schools, unite culture and transform learning. So thanks for watching this episode and thank you San Juan School District for having us down to visit your beautiful part of the state and meet all of the interesting people, students and teachers. Be sure to watch the rest of the UEN PD TV episodes. You can catch them all on YouTube or go to uen.org slash PD TV.